Colossians chapter 1. The whole of this section of this great letter to the Colossians could be given the title of the preeminence of Christ. Chapter 118 ends with the phrase that in everything he might be preeminent. And this emphasis on the preeminence of Jesus is of course made by Paul against a background where teachers, false teachers, were worming their way into the church at Colossae and were detracting and subtracting from the preeminence of Jesus and from the sufficiency of Jesus as the only author and giver of salvation. So Paul sets before them first of all the theme of Christ's eminence and preeminence in creation. In verses 15 to 17, he is the image of the invisible God. In him all things were created in heaven and on earth and so on. And then his preeminence in the new creation, which is the church. In verse 18, he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn, that is the primary figure from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. And now from verse 19, he is turning to Christ's preeminence in redemption. He is preeminent as the head and author of creation. He is preeminent as the head of the church. And now he is preeminent as the author of of redemption. You will know that creation and redemption are God's two mighty acts in history. They are the two great occasions in the history of God's dealings with the world. And here Paul turns, having dealt with Christ's preeminence as the agent in creation, he now turns to tell us that the same Christ is God's agent in redemption. So in these two mighty acts of God in the world, the Lord Jesus Christ is the agent of both. Now chiefly in verses 15 to 18, you would notice from our reading, it is the person of Christ Paul has been emphasizing who he is. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation. He is the one in whom creation finds its significance. But from verse 20 onwards, it is the work of Christ on which he concentrates. That is what he has done. Now the reason that verse 19 between these two verses re-emphasizes Christ's person, in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, is that we must never separate between the person of Christ, who he is, and the work of Christ, what he has done. And that's a quite fundamental principle for a true understanding of the Christian gospel, that the Christ who died on the cross was indeed in his person and nature fully and completely God as well as man. This is not just, you see, the death of any man. It is the death of the God-man who alone is able to effect a full and complete salvation. Let me put this truth to you in the form of two propositions about the relation between Christ's person and his work in our evangelism. Wherever it is done, whether personally or in a corporate sense, whether in an individual setting or a larger setting, there are two fundamental principles about the person and work of Christ which we need to bear in mind in all evangelism. One is that to preach Christ's person apart from his work, is not a gospel. To divide the person and work of Christ in that sense is not a gospel. Now that is the error of a liberal and unbiblical Christianity which presents Jesus as 
a great figure of history about speaks about his person, his works, his peerless behavior, his teaching beyond comparison, may even acknowledge his Godhead, but does not speak of his work on the cross as a Savior, and says to us now, if you look at Christ's life, if you listen to his teaching, if you have this figure of this great person, our guide, our hero, and our friend, as one of the hymns puts it. And if you follow his example, this is the significance of Jesus. Now what I want to point out to you is that that is not a gospel for sinners. Indeed it is a counsel of despair, because people come and they seek to emulate Jesus' living. They seek to follow Jesus' teaching, and they find that they cannot. And they say, what I need is not a lecture about how to live or an example of how to live. What I need is a Savior who will come and radically change my nature and enable me to be a different person. So to preach Christ's person divorced from his work is not a gospel. But similarly, to preach Christ's work apart from his person is not a gospel. You see, man's position as a sinner is such that no mere man could bear the burden of the sin of another. So the question that you get in the hymn, Who is he on yonder tree, died in great agony? That is a crucial question. Who is this figure on the cross who is dying? Who is this Jesus they are nailing to the tree on Calvary? Because if he is merely a man, if he is merely one of us, then there is no hope from the cross of Calvary. There is no gospel in this. Because the plight of man is such that only the intervention of God under whose judgment we live can effect a true and complete salvation. And so the work of bearing our sin required God himself to come and deal with it. You see, a man could not bear the sins of another man because he has his own sins to deal with. That was the problem of the priest in Israel who constantly kept offering sacrifices, but one of these sacrifices was for his own sins. But since it was sin in man that God was coming to deal with, he had to become truly man in order to stand in our place. Now do you see the significance, therefore, of the person of Christ being married to his work? It needed God to come and save us. Mere man could not do it. But it needed God to become one of us because it was man who was the sinner and Jesus came as the God-man, fully God and fully man to stand in our place. So in verse 19 the apostle says, In him, that is in the man Christ Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Now that word fullness is a very significant word in Colossians. It means here the full number that makes up the whole. It is the full complement of something. And what Paul is saying is the full complement of the Godhead dwelt in Jesus. Now this is apostolic Christianity. Whatever else one may think, the apostles clearly held to this, that in Jesus there was the full complement of everything that went to make the Godhead. When just some time ago, a year, 18 months ago, my wife and I were in Greece at a conference of Christian doctors there, which I was sharing, we were staying in a hotel which had all these Greek words up on the notices so that you really needed to know a little bit at least about the alphabet to be able to understand what was happening. And 
I don't know modern Greek, but I do know the characters. And when we came to the lift to take our luggage, first of all, or to go upstairs, I saw above the lift the word pleroma, eight. Now, pleroma is the word that Paul uses here for fullness. And what they were saying in that sign was that when you had eight people, that was the lift full. You couldn't get any more into it. Now, what Paul is saying here is that, if we may put it in these terms, you cannot get any more of the Godhead into Jesus than is there. The fullness, the pleroma of the Godhead is in Jesus. Now that is Paul's expression for the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. All the attributes of God are found in Jesus. And with that clarified, he now proceeds to expound the salvation in which Christ is preeminent from verse 20. And the word he uses, you will notice, to describe it is this word reconciling. In verse 20, through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. It is reconciliation which is the metaphor that Paul uses to describe what Jesus in his preeminence as a Savior has done for us. Now some of the metaphors the New Testament uses to describe the work of grace that Christ has accomplished are less familiar to us than this in daily life. Justification is not a word, for example, that we commonly use. Redemption is not a word that we commonly use, nor Still more so, the word propitiation, which the New Testament uses to describe what salvation involves. But reconciliation is a domestic and familiar metaphor which we readily understand. It speaks of relationships which have been broken, of an alienation which has taken place between people. And we are familiar with that concept in the modern world of reconciliation being necessary between two people, of reconciliation between families, between nations, between different kinds of people in the world. But what Paul discerns by the Holy Spirit is not just a personal alienation between man and God, but you notice in verse 20 a gigantic rupture which has taken place in the universe, dislocating the relationship between man and God, but also throwing into disarray the whole created order. Now, it is part of the biblical testimony that sin, when it comes into the world, does not just disrupt the relationship between man and God as individuals. It disrupts something infinitely deeper and bigger than that. It creates a disruption in the universe and throws it into disarray. In the words of one commentator, the world knows no settled peace. Futility and decay are the hallmarks of creation and hostility and evil are the hallmarks of mankind. Now for such a comprehensive rupture in the universe, which sin has brought about and which you see in all sorts of different ways in the creation, in nature, as we see it in all its turmoil, in all the cruelty of nature. Have you ever thought of this, that that is part of the disruption that sin has caused? And when you speak of a comprehensive salvation in the New Testament terminology, you are speaking about a salvation that deals with that as well. Not only with my relationship to God, but with the disruption in the universe so that the promise of the gospel is there will be new heavens and a new earth 
The lion will lie down with the lamb. There is a reconciliation, do you see, through the whole of the natural order. The trees of the field will clap their hands. Now there is something in nature itself, you see, which sin has disrupted. And what Paul is saying here is that this glorious creator God who has come down in Jesus Christ is dealing with the most radical problems of the universe. And if that is so, then can you not believe that he is able to deal with the problems of your personal life this evening? If this God and Savior in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who is setting in order all that has been ruptured in the universe, can he not set in order your life? And the things that sin has disrupted and destroyed within your life and character? Do you see the immensity of this when God sets about a work of salvation? It has cosmic implications and the point at which this reconciliation touches individual lives is when by faith we receive the reconciliation which God offers to us in Christ now let me point out a number of important truths from these few verses in this connection first of all the condition of man which cries out for reconciliation is that he is both estranged from God and hostile to God. Verse 21 You who once were estranged and hostile in mind doing evil deeds he has now reconciled. You see this is against the background of that cosmic reconciliation in verse 20, through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, and now he comes down to the individual level, you who once were estranged and hostile in mind, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. You will notice the words that the apostle uses hostile first of all not just apathetic do you see not just indifferent what he says is this the condition of the natural man before the God of the Bible before the real Jesus is not just that he is apathetic we often say that about modern man we say his great problem is that he is apathetic to God he is indifferent to the gospel he is apathetic towards Jesus but you know my friends that's not the biblical position that is not what the apostle teaches that is not what the Bible tells us about man it tells us that his deepest condition whatever he may appear like on the surface is that he is hostile to God when we were yet enemies says the apostle that is the condition that we were in and by nature and spirit we are antagonistic to the biblical Jesus. Now it is from that antagonism that all kinds of rebellion arise in the human heart, producing what Paul speaks of in verse 21, the evil deeds that we do. Our evil deeds, our sinful actions are the result, not of an, of an attitude of apathy, nor of indifference towards God, but of a deep-seated rebellion against Him. Now that is our condition by nature. And if you are not a Christian this evening, that is if you have never known the grace of God reconciling you to Him through Jesus Christ, then I tell you that you are in rebellion against God. And when the real Jesus confronts you in His Word, you will discover that there is hostility to him and that reveals itself by a rebellion against his law a dismissing of his word and will and a preference for your own way 
But there is more to it than that. There are two sides to this need for reconciliation, do you notice? It is not just that man is hostile to God or even that he has drifted away from God and rebelled against God. The other side, which is infinitely more serious, is that he is estranged from God. That is, he has been driven away from God. Because in his condition of rebellion, in his condition of hostility, he has drawn down upon him the wrath and anger of a holy God, so that as Adam and Eve were driven out of the Garden of Eden, he is driven out of the presence of God. Now that is man's basic plight. You see, if man's only problem was that he was lost and had drifted away from God, the answer to his problem would be that somebody would show him the way back and say, come now, you'll need to find your way back to God. Or he would suddenly awaken to the misery of this condition of being far away from God. He might see some symptom of it in his life. He might discover some of the effects of being separated from God. And he would say, oh, well, I will just up and off and back to God as my father. But you see, the real problem is that between man and God, there is a great gulf fixed which man himself cannot bridge. The basic barrier in this reconciliation is that God is turned in holy wrath and anger against us in our sin. Now that's man's position. By nature. This is why we say that reconciliation has to come from God. It is not just a change in man that is needed. It is a change in God that is needed that he becomes reconciled to us. And that is of the very essence of what the New Testament teaches us about reconciliation. That leads us to the second truth that Paul puts before us, and it is that the author of this reconciliation is God himself. For in him, verse 19, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether in heaven or on earth, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled. Do you see the subject of the action is God, it is not man. And God it is who has taken the initiative to effect this reconciliation. So that when we hear God preach the gospel to us in the scripture about how men are reconciled to him who are estranged from him, it is preached as something that God has already done and it is presented to us as a gift. And we are reconciled to God when in the words we read in 2 Corinthians 5, we receive the reconciliation. But God is the author of it. The Bible, you see, is not the story of man's search for God. Just about 20 years ago this year, I wrote a most dreadful booklet which InterVarsity Press published entitled The Search for God. I have regretted it, the title anyway, ever since. Mercifully, it's now out of print, so you needn't try and get it. Not that you would want to in any case, but the Bible is not the story of man's search for God. The Bible is the story from the very beginning of Genesis, which begins in the beginning, God. And God is the subject of the Bible. God is the subject of everything that happens in the Bible that is significant for salvation. And it is God who is searching and seeking for man. 
It is God who is on the move to achieve salvation, and he then presents it to us. Now that is what makes the gospel good news. It is not good news to say to somebody, you'd better start searching for God and looking for him if haply you may find him. It is glorious good news when we discover that God has taken the initiative, that he has done everything in Jesus Christ for our salvation, and he comes to us now and says, "'Tis done! Be reconciled to God! Receive the reconciliation, for he has accomplished it in Jesus." The author of reconciliation is God. In that passage we read in 2 Corinthians 5, which speaks of the reconciliation, there are nine main verbs, and all of them have God as their subject. It is God who was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. It was God who did it. Now that is what Paul is saying again here. Thirdly, the agent of the reconciliation is Christ's blood. The alienation which made reconciliation necessary consisted in our hostility to God, our estrangement from God. The author of this reconciliation is God himself. The agent of the reconciliation is Christ's blood. Verse 20, through him to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And verse 22, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. Now more accurately, the agent of reconciliation is Christ and him crucified. It is Jesus in his death as our substitute and saviour that is the agent of reconciliation. This refers, of course, to his shedding of his blood as a sin offering. And Jesus is there on the cross bearing all the implications of our alienation from God and our estrangement from his presence. Now, when he bears that, therefore, He bears all that that alienation means. And packed into these words that Paul uses are the full and glorious truths of the atonement. That what our Lord Jesus was bearing as he reconciled us to God by his blood was all that our alienation from God meant. It meant that hostility and that rebellion. And that rebellion and hostility called forth the judgment of God. That is the legal judgment of God against our transgression. And in his death on the cross, Jesus is bearing that. He bears the result in terms of divine judgment upon every sin that I have committed. But more than that, he bears not only the judgment of sin, he bears the wrath and anger of a holy God, which is the primary cause of my alienation from God. And there is really no place where you see this worked out in all its awesome fullness, as on the Day of Atonement in Israel. We were turning to it some weeks ago in the Bible study in another connection. You will remember that account in Leviticus 16, where on the Day of Atonement, the day you will remember when the war broke out between Egypt and Israel that there was so much concern about in the world. That Day of Atonement is a day that was instituted by God to be a pattern and symbol, if you like, a visual picture of what true atonement was going to mean. How was man going to have the burden of his sin dealt with? Well, the answer is, in Leviticus 16, there are two sacrifices that were made. There was the sacrifice of a slain lamb that was taken, an animal perfect and pure according to God's holy ordinance, without spot or blemish. You will notice how that is fulfilled in Jesus. 
And that animal was slain and it was laid on the altar and the hands of the priest were laid upon the animal and symbolically he transferred the guilt of the people to the animal and its blood was shed to symbolize the fact that an offering had to be made and a sacrifice had to be offered to take away guilt. But then there was another animal. A goat which was taken, which has put a new name into our language. It was called the scapegoat. And that goat was the object to which the priest came on the second occasion. And he laid his hands on it and again transferred the sin of the people and the wrath of a holy God upon sin to that animal. And it was taken, we read, by the hands of a fit man out into the wilderness. Now that was significant. The wilderness was the no man's land where the off-scouring of the earth was dumped. It was the dump of the people. It was the place of isolation and abandonment. And this animal was taken by the hands of a fit man out into that wilderness without the camp and it was let go. It was released and abandoned into the wilderness. Now our Lord Jesus fulfills both of these figures by the offering up of himself as the slain Lamb of God, by the one who went out into the infinite darkness that sin and sinners are involved in before a holy God and cried, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Now that is the sense in which Jesus became our sin-bearer. It is in this sense that he has by his blood made peace with God. That we might be reconciled to God, Jesus experienced the ultimate anguish of being isolated from God. That we who were the objects of God's wrath might become the sons of his love, Jesus, who was the object of his love and the son of his love, became the object of his wrath. And this is the mystery that we were singing about, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain? Now finally the aim of that reconciliation Paul has something to say about. He has now reconciled us in the body of his flesh, verse 22, in order to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him. He bore all this in order that we might enter into the glorious privilege of being reconciled to God. Now what does that imply? Well, Paul says it is that he might present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him. It is access into God's presence which is the glorious privilege of reconciliation. It is being presented before God in the same sense that people are presented before royalty. It is being taken into God's presence. We who were the very off-scouring of the earth we who by our sin were alienated from God. Here is the mystery that God takes us in Christ and gathers us into his presence and presents us spotless, irreproachable and blameless before him. Now one day he is going to do that in a fuller sense when we shall enjoy the glorious privileges of being brought into the presence of God in eternity. But my dear friends, God does not wait until then. You do not wait until then to be presented before him spotless. Because every reconciled sinner is presented now in the presence of God, irreproachable and without blame. He carries you, as it were, covered in his righteousness, born on the wings of his grace into his Father's presence, and he presents you before him 
That is Jesus the mediator, you see. And the point about that, of course, is that the greatest mystery and miracle of grace is that sinful men and women may come like that into the presence of a holy God. But you know, I find myself asking myself this evening, is that really the greatest miracle of grace to me? Is that the greatest prize of salvation to me? That I am presented spotless and blameless and irreproachable before God? And do I cherish being in his presence with that sense of wonder? Or is it something that I take casually and idly and carelessly? Now, says the apostle, that ultimate day when you will be presented before him as a day that you will reach, provided, he says, you notice, that you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which has been preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. He is appealing to them, in other words, this gospel, he says, is a gospel on which you must continue to rest your soul through all your days until that day when you are presented before him. There are all kinds of things that would seek to draw you away, to make you shift from that ground. But through every stage of life, from every situation that you may find yourself in, Paul appeals to them. Do not be shifted from the ground of this gospel, he says. And do not be shifted from this glorious hope that one day the same Savior will bear you into the presence of God, irreproachable, blameless, spotless. What a God and what a Savior Christ is. What a glorious thing he has done for sinful men and women. And how much we need to cry to God that we might prize this blessing. Let us pray together. Almighty God, we bow in wonder before you at the mysteries of all that you have wrought for us in Jesus Christ. And we pray that our hearts may be stirred and our spirits awakened, that we may cleave to Christ afresh that we may rest on this glorious gospel and that we may not be moved from such ground as you have brought us on. Oh, hear us, we pray, that if some of us are still estranged from you and hostile in our minds to Jesus, we may be reconciled this very evening and drawn to him, and find in him our everlasting hope. We ask it for his great name's sake. Amen.